The sign said, electrified fence, 10,000 volts, do not touch. But Nedry opened it with his bare hand and unlocked the gate, swinging it wide. He went back to the jeep, drove through the gate, and then walked back to close it behind him. Now he was inside the park itself, no more than a mile from the east dock. He stepped on the accelerator and hunched forward over the steering wheel, peering through the rain-slashed windshield as he drove the jeep down the narrow road. He was driving fast, too fast, but he had to keep to his timetable. He was surrounded on all sides by black jungle, but soon he should be able to see the beach and the ocean off to his left. This damn storm, he thought. It might screw up everything, because if Dodgson's boat wasn't waiting for him at the east dock when Nedry got there, the whole plan would be ruined. Nedry couldn't wait very long or he would be missed back at the control room. The whole idea behind the plan was that he could drive to the east dock, drop off the embryos, and be back in a few minutes before anyone noticed. It was a good plan, a clever plan. Nedry'd worked on it carefully, refining every detail. This plan was going to make him a million and a half dollars. 1.5 meg. That was ten years of income in a single tax-free shot, and it was going to change his life. Nedry'd been damn careful, even to the point of making Dodgson meet him in the San Francisco airport at the last minute with an excuse about wanting to see the money. Actually, Nedry wanted to record his conversation with Dodgson and mention him by name on the tape, just so that Dodgson wouldn't forget he owed the rest of the money. Nedry was including a copy of the tape with the embryos. In short, Nedry had thought of everything. Except this damn storm. Something dashed across the road, a white flash in his headlight. It looked like a large rat. It scurried into the underbrush, dragging a fat tail. <laughs> possum. Amazing that a possum could survive here. You'd think the dinosaurs would get an animal like that. Where was the damn dock? He was driving fast, and he'd already been gone five minutes. He should have reached the east dock by now. Had he taken a wrong turn? He didn't think so. He hadn't seen any forks in the road at all. Then where was the dock? It was a shock when he came around a corner and saw that the road terminated in a gray concrete barrier six feet tall and streaked dark with rain. He slammed on the brakes and the jeep fishtailed, losing traction in an end-to-end -end spin. And for a horrified moment, he thought he was going to smash into the barrier. He knew he was going to smash. And he spun the wheel frantically and the jeep slid to a stop, the headlamps just a foot from the concrete wall. He paused there, listening to the rhythmic flick of the wipers. He took a deep breath and exhaled slowly. He looked back down the road. Ah, he'd obviously taken a wrong turn somewhere. He could retrace his steps, but that would take too long. He'd better try and find out where the hell he was. He got out of the jeep, feeling heavy raindrops spatter his head. It was a real tropical storm, raining so hard that it hurt. He glanced at his watch, pushing the button to illuminate the digital dial. Six minutes gone. Where the hell was he? He walked around the concrete barrier, and on the other side, along with the rain, he heard the sound of gurgling water. Could it be the ocean? Nedry hurried forward, his eyes adjusting to the darkness as he went. Dense jungle on all sides, raindrops slapping on the leaves. The gurgling sound became louder, drawing him forward. And suddenly he came out of the foliage and felt his feet sink into soft earth and saw the dark currents of the river. The river! He was at the jungle river. Damn, he thought. At the river where? The river ran for miles through the island. He looked at his watch again. Seven minutes gone. You have a problem, Dennis, he said aloud. As if in reply... There was a soft hooting cry of an owl in the forest. Nedry hardly noticed. He was worrying about his plan. The plain fact was the time had run out. There wasn't a choice anymore. He had to abandon his original plan. 
All he could do was go back to the control room, restore the computer, and somehow try to contact Dodgson to set up the drop at the East Dock for the following night. Nedry would have to scramble to make that work, but he thought he could pull it off. The computer automatically logged all calls. After Nedry got through to Dodgson, he'd have to go back into the computer and erase the record of the call, but one thing was sure. He couldn't stay out in the park any longer, or his absence would be noticed. Nedry started back, heading toward the glow of the car's headlights. He was drenched and miserable. He heard the soft hooting cry once more, and this time he paused. That hadn't really sounded like an owl, and it seemed to be close by, in the jungle, somewhere off to his right. As he listened, he heard a crashing sound in the underbrush, then silence. He waited and heard it again. It sounded distinctly like something big, moving slowly through the jungle toward him. Something big, something near, a big dinosaur. Get out of here. Nedry began to run. He made a lot of noise as he ran, but even so, he could hear the animal crashing through the foliage and hooting. It was coming closer. Stumbling over tree roots in the darkness, clawing his way past dripping branches, he saw the jeep ahead, and the lights shining around the vertical wall of the barrier made him feel better. In a moment, he'd be in the car, and then he'd get the hell out of here. He scrambled around the barrier, and then he froze. The animal was already there. But it wasn't close. The dinosaur stood 40 feet away at the edge of the illumination from the headlamps. Nedry hadn't taken the tour, so he hadn't seen the different types of dinosaurs, but this one was strange-looking. The ten-foot-tall body was yellow with black spots, and along the head ran a pair of red, V-shaped crests. The dinosaur didn't move, but again gave its soft hooting cry. Nedry waited to see if it would attack. It didn't. Perhaps the headlights from the jeep frightened it, forcing it to keep its distance like a fire. The dinosaur stared at him, and then snapped its head in a single swift motion. Nedry felt something smack wetly against his chest. He looked down and saw a dripping glob of foam on his rain-soaked shirt. He touched it curiously, not comprehending. It was spit. The dinosaur had spit on him. It was creepy, he thought. He looked back at the dinosaur and saw the head snap again and immediately felt another wet smack against his neck, just above the shirt collar. He wiped it away with his hand. Jesus, it was disgusting. But the skin of his neck was already starting to tingle and burn, and his hand was tingling too. It was almost like he had been touched with acid. Nedry opened the car door, glancing back at the dinosaur to make sure it wasn't going to attack, and felt a sudden excruciating pain in his eyes, stabbing like spikes into the back of his skull, and he squeezed his eyes shut and gasped with the intensity of it, then threw up his hands to cover his eyes and felt the slippery foam trickling down both sides of his nose. Spit. The dinosaur had spit in his eyes. Even as he realized it, the pain overwhelmed him, and he dropped to his knees, disoriented, wheezing. He collapsed onto his side, his cheek pressed to the wet ground, his breath coming in thin whistles the constant, ever-screaming pain that caused flashing spots of light to appear behind his tightly shut eyelids. The earth shook beneath him, and Nedry knew the dinosaur was moving. He could hear its soft, hooting cry, and despite the pain, he forced his eyes open, and still he saw nothing but flashing spots against black. Slowly, the realization came to him. He was blind. The hooting was louder as Nedry scrambled to his feet and staggered back against the side panel of the car as a wave of nausea and dizziness swept over him. The dinosaur was close now. He could feel it coming close. He was dimly aware of its snorting breath, but he couldn't see. He couldn't see anything. And his terror was extreme. He stretched out his hands, waving them wildly in the air to ward off the attack he knew was coming. And then there was a new searing pain like a fiery knife in his belly. And Nedry stumbled, reaching blindly down to touch the ragged edge of his shirt, and then a thick, slippery mass that was surprisingly warm. And with horror, he suddenly knew he was holding his own intestines in his hands. 
The dinosaur had torn him open. His guts had fallen out. Nedry fell to the ground and landed on something scaly and cold. It was the animal's foot. And then there was a new pain on both sides of his head. The pain grew worse. And as he was lifted to his feet, he knew the dinosaur had his head in its jaws. And the horror of that realization was followed by a final wish that it would all be ended soon. <laughs>